Production of Los Braceros Strong Arms to Aid the USA is made possible by the public television stations of the Pacific Mountain Network and by Amador and Rosalie Bustos in honor of all the Mexican families who have toiled in the American fields. Imagine leaving your home and everything that's familiar, saying goodbye to family and friends to work in the fields, on farms, on the railroads in a country other than your own. That is what millions of Mexican men did between 1942 and 1964. They were called braceros, for the Spanish word for arms, brazos. These strong-armed men came over the border to work in the United States, initially filling a void left by American men going overseas to fight in World War II. Hello, I'm Xochitl Arellano, and I am the daughter of a bracero. The story of my own father and the millions of other braceros is one of hard work and of struggle, and at the same time of opportunity, opportunity to forge a better life for themselves and for their families. It is largely a story untold, their contributions unrecognized in the United States until now. It began in 1942, shortly after the United States entered World War II. An agreement between the U.S. and Mexican governments allowed and encouraged Mexican men to work on thousands of temporary jobs in the United States. The news about this new Braceros program spread quickly to every bustling city and remote village in Mexico. To get started, all a man had to do was to apply at one of the country's screening centers. First of all, they ran ads, newspaper ads, was ran by the Mexican government to attract people from particularly the rural areas uh, to come into the cities. And one of the first cities that opened up the centers was Mexico City in 1942. And in 1942, they attracted braceros, too many of them actually, to, to be contracted. Um, they figured they'd get a four or five thousand, they got about fifty thousand people just in the city of Mexico the first time they tried to contract them. During the more than 20 years that the Bracero program was in effect, more than two million Mexican men came across the border to work, most trying to escape wrenching poverty at home. You have to remember when these folks came over they were mostly seemed like they were destitute. If I didn't do that in Pesajuno you know, like Bracero, we'd die over there because it was poor out there. While most work was in farming, ranching, and on railroads in the western and southwestern states, braceros were scattered throughout much of the United States, including the Midwest and South. As the name suggests, recruiters looked for men with strong arms and something else. That's one of the things that recruiters looked for was calloused hands because they wanted men who had experience in manual labor. The Braceros program was administered by the United States Department of Labor. It required that employers pay at least minimum wage plus supply the men with other benefits such as housing. Mediators with the Department of Labor were on call to help resolve any problems. In the early 1950s, Bob Porter worked with Braceros as part of his job with the Doña Ana County Farm Bureau in Las Cruces, New Mexico. They had uh, local compliance men with the Department of Labor, and, and as I recall, there were about three of them here, and they were Hispanics, Spanish-speaking people who had a good feel for both uh, farming and for the bracero. And these guys' responsibility was to handle complaints and, and uh, to take care of any disputes that might arise, either from the job or uh, living conditions or whatever. While still in Mexico, prospective braceros were screened to make sure they had no criminal record. As a result, there were no serious incidents of law-breaking involving braceros during the entire history of the program. Initially, it was set to end after World War II when the GIs came home, but that didn't happen. Well, because the World War II <laughs> veterans did not want to return to the fields. I can give you a real good example of that is my father. Uh, my father worked in the fields and my mother worked in the canneries. And so when my father was working in the fields, World War II erupted. He was drafted. 
And so someone had to take his place. So that's when the Bracero program came in to take his place. Some Braceros came for reasons other than work. Chris Luna, a retired teacher in San Jose, California, used the Bracero program as a way to go back to school. I already knew that I, that I wanted to get an education. Uh, the Bracero program is the instrument that helped me start on, 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 on that road. My own father, a Bracero in the 1940s, knew two men who were lured by simple curiosity. I had two friends, university students. They had heard stories about how easy it was to earn money in the United States and all that. Then we arrived here and found work in farming. Hard work. Two weeks later, they said, Thanks, America, but we're going back to Mexico. They asked me, Are you going to stay? I said, Yes, I'm going to stay because I need the money. And off they went. For many braceros, their first stop in the United States was near the city of El Paso, Texas, which shares the border with the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. El Paso has always been, until very recently, the major port of entry for Mexicans coming into the United States. And this was also a major port of entry for braceros coming into the United States. Men coming over the border were often transported by train from Mexico's interior, then processed at a facility like this one, the Rio Vista Center in the town of Socorro, outside El Paso. It started as a poor farm for housing rural poor people and even held German and Italian prisoners during World War II. But following the war and until 1964, it was the clearinghouse where thousands of braceros were contracted to work in the United States. My father was a farmer. I was born in the country and I studied agriculture at school in Mexico. And his background in farming made José Ramírez Delgado a natural for the braceros program. Mr. Delgado came from northern Mexico where cotton was widely grown. That gave him and some fellow braceros an advantage since picking cotton was a skill in high demand in Texas and New Mexico. Well, we were special because we knew about all sorts of work on the farm, but there were braceros who didn't have our knowledge, so we were able to teach them. After close to 15 years as a bracero, Mr. Delgado moved back to Mexico and had a long career with a sportswear manufacturing company. Today, he lives in Juarez, the Mexican city across the Rio Grande from El Paso. This was the first time he'd been back to Rio Vista in decades. Here is the history of the Braceros. For us in Rio Vista, it's a great story. It's been years since I've been here, but it makes me happy. Thank God I've been able to come back to see where I was contracted to work in the fields. I even worked at that ranch across the street. While part of Rio Vista serves as a popular community center, much of it sits in a state of arrested decay. Many of its old adobe buildings crumbling but that makes it easy to imagine what life was like for men coming over the border to work in this unfamiliar new world. Still here, old metal bed frames where the braceros rested before being sent to their assignments. Barracks, where men congregated and slept. Sinks and bathrooms, Quonset huts where health screenings took place. While considered necessary, these were still humiliating. The braceros were stripped, disinfected for lice, then examined. 
this was where they d drew the blood and the next one where they did x-rays or like vice versa. But these were the buildings on the- Minerva Chiram remembers it well. As a new high school graduate in 1957, her very first job was in the Rio Vista typing pool, processing contracts for incoming and outgoing braceros. Her family came from Mexico, so she spoke fluent Spanish. She processed up to 40 contracts a day, working for the program until it ended in 1964. The ones that I remember most vivid are the people that came from the state of Oaxaca. They were indigenous people, and they were very poor. And they had walked for miles and miles, and when they came here, they had type of sandals and uh, their feet were bleeding and oh it was just awful they had their white clothes and everything and i don't know how long they hadn't eaten because i was typing a contract for one of the gentlemen and i was asking him questions and suddenly i looked down you know to, to, at the typewriter to type to the contract what i was typing and i looked up and he wasn't there anymore and so i looked around and nobody said anything none of the braceros said there was about 200 braceros in the building at that time and i said where's the gentleman that i was talking to and they said, he's right there, right in front of you. And I looked over my desk, and sure enough, he had passed, passed out. You know, he had fainted. After being screened and processed, the braceros were issued identification cards. Recruiters from farms, ranches, and railroad companies selected the workers they needed, then sent them by bus or train to their new jobs. Few, if any, braceros were rejected. The United States Department of Labor mandated that braceros made minimum wage, paid by the hour or by the pound for jobs like picking cotton. As mentioned before, those with prior agricultural experience proved to be more valuable. Facundo Ruiz and Lucio Apodaca are brothers-in-law who worked as braceros in the 1940s. I learned how to drive a tractor because I was from the country, from a ranch, so I knew how to plow with mules, and that helped me learn how to plow with a tractor. At that time, I started earning $3.70 a day for nine hours of work. And when I started to plow in straight lines, the boss raised my pay to $4. That was even better. Acceptance of braceros depended largely on where they worked. Among the worst places to be assigned, was eastern Texas, culturally more like the Deep South than the American Southwest. Discrimination was still evident, particularly in states like Texas, which um, was denied braceros when the program began because of the long history of discrimination. There were still signs that said no Mexicans or dogs allowed in various restaurants or public, par uh, public areas. In the southwestern states of New Mexico, Arizona, and West Texas, Many farmers and ranchers were familiar with Mexican culture and spoke Spanish. Isidro Peña worked as a bracero in 1959. He became a successful pecan farmer and store owner in Las Cruces, but has never mastered English. He never had to. Most of the farmers here know Spanish. 90% of the ones that I worked for spoke Spanish very well. That's one of the problems. You don't learn to speak English because you don't hear it. Most, but not all, of the money the braceros earned made its way to their families in Mexico. I sent it to my people. At that time, I still had my mom and my younger siblings to take care of. The rest of the money I spent at dances, finding girlfriends, and doing whatever I wanted. That's right, because I was young. The contrast between the time the braceros were first contracted and when they finally went home to Mexico was dramatic and made a lasting impression on Minerva Chiram. When they came here, the camp was very quiet. They would sleep and it was very quiet. When they came back from going to the farms and being contracted, every one of them had a radio. And every one of them had it full blast and on a different station. So you can imagine what it sounded like. great job. It was a great, not only a job, it was, for me it was just not, a, not just a job, it was helping people, helping somebody to better their lives. It was great.
While the southwestern United States was the starting point for many braceros, most eventually spent time in California, which had and still has the most productive agricultural land in the United States. Whether harvesting Brussels sprouts along the coast or picking tree fruit in the San Joaquin Valley, Braceros continued a long tradition of immigrant labor in the state. The city of Stockton honors contributions of the Braceros with this statue downtown. Stockton resident Octavio Camarena worked as a bracero and remembers back-breaking labor using tools that were eventually outlawed. The most difficult tool was the short-handled hoe because a lot of people damaged their lower backs, an injury that lasted their entire lives. Today there are still people walking around bent over. The hot summers often made working conditions unbearable. Heat stroke and dehydration could stop a man in his tracks. Salvador Chavez was laid up by heat stroke, but as luck would have it, when he recovered, he found another job in cooler conditions. So they told me about a chance to work on a dairy farm. And I worked there for two years, milking cows. It was hard, but it was at night, so I took it. Braceros were also critical to the Pacific Northwest, especially in places like the Yakima Valley in eastern Washington. Well, something unique about this valley is that um, it's, it's one of the nation's premier valleys in terms of, of agricultural production. It rivals the San Joaquin Valley in California, the Salt River Valley in, in Arizona, the Rio Grande Valley in, in Texas. And the only limitation here uh, is the short growing season. During World War II, when field hands were drawn to the Seattle area to work in the defense industry, braceros filled the void, harvesting sugar beets or hops and working on the railroads. But unlike California and the Southwest, with their long Mexican-American history, the Northwest knew little about these newcomers, making life more isolating, lonelier for the typical bracero. What community was there that he could interact with in contrast to a bracero in California or Arizona. There are no Mexican restaurants to speak of. There is no entertainment for Mexican people. There is no, the, the, the social fabric that is in the communities today was non-existent in the 1940s. Still, the contributions made by braceros in the Northwest were publicly valued and eventually many of the men brought their families to the United States, establishing themselves in farm towns like Granger with its lively Mexican radio station. And Topanish, with a colorful mural honoring the men who did so much to help the United States in the 1940s and beyond. Me contrataron braceros para el betabel mentado. These men went through a lot to get their jobs and to get, you know, what, what they considered a better life or at least a little extra money to take home. Whenever I watch the World War II documentary, they talk about how Americans won the war and true and the sacrifices that Americans went through. But who fed the Americans? Who fed the airlines? It was Mexicans braceros. In recent years, a concerted effort has been made to give braceros the respect and recognition they deserve. This includes trying to recoup money deducted from their paychecks in the first years of the program. Well, the bracero program lasted from 1942 to 1964, and there were periods of time when 10% of the braceros' paychecks would be held back. And the idea was to hold it back until they returned to Mexico, at which point they would be given that 10%. So it was kind of an enforced savings program. But millions of dollars that were held back just disappeared. Hemos estado, uh, organizándonos. 
activists like Luis Magaña of Stockton, California, and Daniel Ezequiel Morfin in Granger, Washington, are working with attorneys to find out what happened to those millions of dollars. While it's been a long struggle, they're confident that one day the Braceros or their families will receive at least some of the money they're due. On the cultural front, musicians like Juan Barco of Seattle celebrate the musical heritage of the Braceros in the form of corridos, stories of struggle, hardship, and triumph. The most ambitious program of all is being conducted by the Smithsonian Institution, working with the Institute of Oral History at the University of Texas at El Paso. The goal? To record in their own words as many life stories as possible from braceros in the United States and Mexico, many of whom are now in their 80s and 90s. Capturing the stories, any story is important. I think people need to capture that and learn about their history and about their family because, you know, once, once your relatives have passed away, I mean, you'll lose that story and you'll never know. And I think that's just really important. The Braceros program officially ended in 1964, in part because of accusations that it undermined wages for U.S. citizens. In the 22 years of its existence, more than four and a half million contracts were drawn up for two million Mexican men. While some returned home to Mexico, many more stayed in the United States, becoming permanent legal residents or citizens of their newly adopted country. Most of the Braceros are now senior citizens. They form the backbone of today's Latin American community, overcoming difficult working conditions, separation from everything familiar to them in Mexico. Eventually, they reunited with their families, started new lives in the United States, and achieved the American dream. I'm Xochitl Arellano, and thank you for joining us. Braceros para el metabel mentado. de septiembre. Production of Los Braceros Strong Arms to Aid the USA was made possible by the public television stations of the Pacific Mountain Network and by Amador and Rosalie Bustos in honor of all the Mexican families who have toiled in the American fields.